Welcome and thanks for joining us as we take a closer look at Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. You know those iconic 60-foot tall faces carved right into the granite of South Dakota's Black Hills? Yeah. It's a spot that draws over 2 million visitors every year. It's amazing. Today we'll uncover some of the lesser-known stories behind this truly monumental American landmark. It's a project that almost didn't happen as we know it. Oh, really? Yeah. The idea was born in 1923. Okay. The brainchild of Doan Robinson, okay. South Dakota state historian. <laughs> he was looking for a way to draw tourists to his state and initially imagined carving Western figures, not presidents. So no Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Lincoln staring out at us from the mountain? Nope. That's a wild thought. Who did he have in mind instead? Think Lewis and Clark. Okay. Buffalo Bill Cody. Wow. Even Chief Red Cloud. Huh. It was meant to be a celebration of the American West, but when sculptor Gutzon Borglum came on board, okay. he steered the project towards a more national theme honoring presidents. That was a pretty significant shift. Makes sense why he'd be drawn to presidents. They'd resonate with a much wider audience. Absolutely. But why a Mount Rushmore specifically? It wasn't the first choice. Oh. Initially, Borglum was drawn to a cluster of granite formations known as the Needles near Harney Peak. And Needles. Yeah, they had that dramatic, jagged look. Okay. But practically speaking, they just weren't suitable. How so? The rock formations were too thin to support such massive sculptures. That makes sense. Carving 60-foot faces into crumbling rock probably wouldn't end well. Exactly. Plus, there were environmental and religious concerns. Oh, right. The Lakota people consider the Black Hills sacred and carving into the needles would have been highly disrespectful. So they shifted their focus to Mount Rushmore. What made it a better fit? A few key reasons. First, the granite there was much more solid and durable ideal for a project of this scale. Makes sense. Plus, its southeast exposure meant the sculptures would get bathed in sunlight, right. making them more visible to visitors and also easier to work on. Sunlight would be a pretty important consideration for the carvers, I imagine. Absolutely. But even with Mount Rushmore chosen, the challenges were just beginning. I bet. Once work began in 1927, the crew faced incredibly tough conditions. Working on a mountainside hundreds of feet in the air can't be a walk in the park. You're telling me, imagine climbing 700 stairs just to reach the work site every day. Wow. And that was before they even started carving. Oh my gosh. They were literally dangling in these things called bosun chairs. Bosun chairs. Hanging hundreds of feet in the air and using dynamite to blast away the granite. Incredibly dangerous stuff. Dynamite. That seems incredibly risky, especially when you're aiming for such intricate detail. It was a delicate balance between power and precision. Mm. And to top it off, they had to contend with South Dakota's unpredictable weather oh, yeah. and natural cracks in the granite, which threw some real curveballs into the process. The cracks in the granite. That sounds like a major obstacle. Yeah. Did they have to make any significant changes to the plan because of that? They did. And it affected one of the most recognizable features of Mount Rushmore. Okay. Thomas Jefferson's face. Wait, something's different about Jefferson's face I've never noticed. It's not about the face itself, but its position. Okay. He was originally supposed to be to Washington's right, but as they started carving, they hit a patch of unsuitable rock. Uh-oh. They had to make a tough call move, Jefferson, or abandon the entire project. So they moved him. Yeah. That seems like a pretty drastic change this late in the game. It was. They repositioned Jefferson to the left of Washington, which actually had a ripple effect on the entire monument's design. Really? How so? Well, remember, Borglum's grand plan for the entablature, that massive inscription detailing U.S. history meant to be carved right beside the presidential faces? Yeah, I remember reading about that. It was supposed to be huge, almost like a history textbook carved into the mountain. Exactly. But moving Jefferson meant there wasn't enough suitable rock space left, mm. so they had to abandon that part of the plan. So Jefferson's move forced them to simplify the design focusing solely on those four iconic faces. It did, and it probably contributed to Mount Rushmore's enduring appeal. Those stark profiles against the granite, they've become instantly recognizable. They have. But speaking of iconic, let's talk about another feature that wasn't part of the original design, the Avenue of Flags. Ah, uh, yes, that colorful display leading up to the monument. It definitely adds to the experience. It does. But I have to admit, I don't know much about its history. Well, it wasn't added until 1976 as part of the U.S. Bicentennial celebrations. It's a relatively recent addition to the site. So what's there today? 56 flags in total. They represent all 50 states, one district, three territories, and two commonwealths. Are they arranged in any particular order? Alphabetically, which mm -hmm. can make for a fun little challenge as you walk along the avenue trying to spot your state flag. 
I like that. Adds a bit of an interactive element for visitors. So we've got the presidential face of the Avenue of Flags, but weren't there even bigger plans for Mount Rushmore that never came to fruition? Oh, absolutely. Borglum was a visionary, and his original concept for the monument was far grander than what we see today. What did he have in mind? Well, besides the entablature, which we already discussed, he also envisioned carving the presidents from head to waist. Whoa, can you imagine? Those figures would have been colossal. They would have been. But ultimately, it was just too ambitious. Funding was always an issue, and the rock quality wasn't consistently good enough to support sculptures of that size. So practicality and maybe a little bit of budget reality set in? Exactly. But even more ambitious was his plan for a hall of records. A hall of records? Yeah. What was that supposed to be? He envisioned a grand chamber carved right into the mountain behind the sculptures. What would it have housed? Important documents and artifacts from American history. Think the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, things like that. Borglum wanted it to be a time capsule of sorts, preserving America's story for future generations. Wow, it sounds almost like an ancient Egyptian tomb hidden away inside the mountain. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> but sadly, that grand vision never came to be. A combination of factors. Funding was always a challenge. And then World War II broke out, which understandably shifted national priorities. Makes sense. Yeah. So the Hall of Records remained a dream. Mm. But wait, wasn't there some talk about a tunnel behind the sculptures? You're right. There's actually a tunnel leading into the mountain behind Lincoln's head. It was part of Borglum's initial work on the Hall of Records, but it was never finished. So what's in it now? Not the grand chamber Borglum imagined. Yeah. In the 1990s, they placed a titanium vault in there. A titanium vault. That sounds pretty high tech for a project that started in the 1920s. It is. The vault contains some important documents, including information about the monument's construction, a copy of the Declaration of Independence, and Borglum's autobiography. So a mini hall of records. You could say that. It's a small tribute to Borglum's original vision. It's amazing how a project of this scale, with so many challenges and changes, even tragedies along the way, managed to become such a powerful symbol. It really is. Mount Rushmore is more than just a monument. It's a testament to human ambition, perseverance, and the enduring spirit of America. And a reminder that even the grandest visions require adaptation and compromise along the way. Absolutely. It's a story of grand dreams meeting the realities of nature, budget constraints, and world events. Yeah, it really makes you think about the human cost, too. Oh, absolutely. Those workers were incredibly brave. Putting their lives on the line every day to create this masterpiece. And for years, too. It wasn't a quick project. No, it spanned over a decade. Yeah, from 1927 to 1941. Wow. So they were up there through the Great Depression and the start of World War II. That's right. Talk about dedication. It's mind-boggling. Yeah. It's a story that continues to unfold yeah. as Mount Rushmore draws millions of visitors each year. It really does. Inspiring awe and sparking conversations about American history, uh -huh. artistry, and the very meaning of national identity. It's a powerful place. Well said. Mount Rushmore is more than just a collection of faces carved into a mountain. Right. It's a symbol, a story and a conversation starter all rolled into one. I think that's a great way to put it. And it reminds us that even in the face of adversity, Mm -hmm. Human ambition and ingenuity can achieve incredible things. It's a testament to that, for sure. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Yes. It's when we take a closer look at another great topic. <laughs>